despite the numerical complexity associated to this interferometric imaging problem, there are still a few qualitative statements that we can make that help us understand a little better uh, what we can expect in terms of properties for our interferometric images. And so we need to go back to the very fundamentals about the science of interferences. We have to remember that everything starts from uh, the diffraction pattern of a single telescope. That uh, telescope is characterized by an aperture of a given size d, which means that we are going to form a diffraction pattern of size lambda on d. It is within that lambda on the uh, disk that uh, when we start involving more than one telescope, that we are going to form interference fringes and the characteristic size of those fringes is of course going to be lambda on b, where b is the distance that now separates um, my two apertures. What I want to point out is that um, the size of the diffraction pattern we started from actually imposes a limit on the field of view that can actually be imaged by our interferometer. And if you do the numerical application, which is something you should be able to do right off the bat since following the section one of this course, then you can compute that in the near infrared. And those numbers you have here on the screen are for wavelength of 1.6 microns, that this field of view for an eight meter telescope is actually limited to 50 milli arc seconds only. And if you go to a smaller telescope of about two meter arc, you have 1.8 meter, and then that field of view increases back to about 180 milli arc seconds. So this is something that may be counterintuitive. The fact that uh, for, to, in order to observe extended objects, objects that are going to be, you know, significantly larger than 15 milli arc seconds, and it's pretty easy to find targets of that type. Um, many uh, circumstellar disks uh, near, uh, of around nearby stars uh, are actually significantly larger than this. And so what that means is that in order to efficiently observe these objects and be able to produce images or even just constrain them well, you are going to um, be better off observing them with smaller telescopes, 1.8 meter telescopes, than the 8 meter telescopes. Uh, those numbers of 8 and 1.8 are of course picked up because they, they do happen to correspond to the sizes of the telescopes that are uh, currently in use at uh, the LTI. And so this is a strategy for your observing. Also, keep in mind that you may actually prefer to go with the smaller telescopes, not necessarily go with the large telescopes to carry out your observation. If you begin evolving more than simply two telescopes, well, you can look at the corresponding diffraction pattern and see that it's becoming slightly more complex, uh, but it's still characterized by uh, periodic structures. Um, and you can always relate the periodicity in those structures to the original baselines uh, in the array. Here, I've added a third telescope and uh, have highlighted, for instance, the baseline B2, and you can recognize um, a new set of fringes in my image characterized by the spacing lambda on B2. If you push that to the extreme and go to an array made of a very large number of apertures, and uh, the example here I've picked is that of a, a 19 aperture array where the, all of the telescopes are organized along um, an, an annulus or a ring. And this is what the corresponding diffraction pattern actually looks like. The interference, free, uh, the interference pattern looks like. And um, what you see, and the reason why I'm so confused when I talk about this, is that it looks very much like the diffraction pattern that would have been produced by a giant telescope of diameter B itself. We can see that uh, at the very center of that uh, field of view of um, you know, the original size we had before, 50 or 180 million seconds here, we do form something that looks very much like the image of a giant telescope. Uh, and we can see that the core of that, we can even go as far as calling it a PSF, a point spread function, 
is of characteristic size lambda on b. There's a couple other interesting features to that very specific example. The fact that that diffraction uh, core is actually surrounded very much like in the case of the, um, the circular aperture uh, by a series of concentric rings that are very reminiscent of our uh, familiar area rings. Um, up to a certain level, beyond which the interference function becomes a little bit more complex again and, and sort of harder to, in, to directly interpret. You can actually relate the extent of that, let's call it clean region, uh, to the shortest baseline that, uh, that is used in the array. So the, the, the spacing between the, the, the two of the closest telescopes, which corresponds to uh, two nearby telescopes along the, along the ring here, they are going to, um, to set the extent of that somewhat clean region of our image. Uh, what that means is that you can actually relate the, uh, the ratio of the resolution given by the maximum baseline and the uh, extent of that clean region given by the shortest baseline. And the ratio of these two numbers, uh, b over s squared, is somehow a very good estimate for the number of resolution elements you are going to uh, be able to uh, get uh, in your original image. And a final consideration is that this 19 telescope array uh, produces up to about, I think, 171 distinct uh, UV points, uh, which means that uh, you should be able to uh, characterize an object um, that is made of, um, you could think of uh, individual pixels of uh, up to about 171. And so this is, uh, again, another constraint about uh, what we would call the complexity of the source, um, the, the, the number of elements that uh, your source is actually made from has to be uh, smaller than uh, the number of UV points. Uh, if you go beyond that, then the source is a little bit more uh, complex and uh, the characterization you make about it is uh, somewhat incomplete. But if you respect um, those uh, parameters and you uh, make sure that the source you're observing it fits within the field of view of one single, uh, imposed by the size of one single telescope, and that you have uh, enough uh, individual um, visibility measurements in order to constrain a model made of the numbers of degrees of freedom you require for your image, then in that case you're all good and you should be able to end up with a beautiful interferometric image.